I, I'm so surprised to hear that you are not an animal protein person because A, you're so fit. I mean, it's insanely, you're, you're insanely fit. But I mean, just in terms of the satiation piece of it, right? Like animal protein is, for me, is much more satiating and plant protein, I found it harder to get enough of. Are you mm -hmm. saying it's just e equally is okay in terms of building lean muscle mass? Have you, were yep. you an animal yep. protein person and you switched or what was? When I was 15, we took a field trip to a pig slaughterhouse down the five. Oh <laughs> so um that will I've do been, it uh, yeah so i'm well beyond 15 now and that was the first like four way into it i had issues back in the day because there was no such thing as plant-based and so i've kind of fought my way through but i've been plant-based for a very very long time women underestimate recovery all of the time so polarized means that you're staying out of that middle zone so you can go super hard when you need to, and you recover super easy. So we look at the moderate intensity stuff as it's too hard to be easy, and it's too easy to be hard to invoke change. Stay out of that. You want to be hard to invoke change, and you want to go easy to recover so that you can go hard again. How many times a week would you recommend someone doing this type of workout? Uh, bare minimum, we see two sprint interval sessions or one sprint and one high intensity session and three lifting sessions a week. But you can combine the sprint and the lifting for one day in the gym. So you might do uh, lower body posterior chain work. Where we're doing hip thrusts and deadlifts. And then we finish off with some sprints on the bike. And then you're done and dusted. Or maybe you... Um, do box jumps instead of sprints on the bike as your high intensity work, and then you're done and dusted. So like I was saying earlier, it's about the quality of the work that you're doing rather than the volume of the work that you're doing. Why is jump training so popular? Not popular. Why is jump training so important? When we look at how bones respond to stress, we need multidirectional stress to invoke actual bone regeneration and increasing your bone density. Jumping does that because you're landing and it's complete stress in all the different planes that go up through the skeletal system, which then causes a cascade response of, I need to be stronger through the entire bone. If we look at just running, it's very uniplanar and it doesn't cause that multidirectional stress. We look at walking, it doesn't either. Strength training does, but not to the extent of jump training. So if people can't jump, strength training is going to help improve bone density, especially the heavier work that, that you should be doing. But just plain running doesn't do it. What's the, what would be considered jump training? Like plyo jumps, like on a box? You, you can do that. When we're looking specifically at building bone, it's a landing not how we've been taught with soft knees, but absorbing the impact through our bones. We're not jumping mm. really high. We might be on a low box and jumping off as a depth jump and landing kind of flat-footed and hard or doing pogo, mm. pogo jumping where you're flat-footed and absorbing the impact through your skeletal system. And it only takes 10 minutes, three times a week at the most to invoke change. So this, don't laugh, but how about just jumping on a trampoline? Because you're still going that, you're still going up and down vertically. But you're not getting the, the impact pounding. from the ground. Because our body moves when it hits the ground. The ground doesn't move. Whereas right. the trampoline, it moves. So you're not getting the same kind of reactive force through the skeletal system. How about, I, you're, a, you're a nutrition scientist as well, so what is your take on women and fasting in perimenopause and menopause? If I were to use the buzzwords or the buzzwords of fasting, I would say you do your 12-hour overnight fast. That's what you do for fasting. But when we look at it from a hormonal response, reducing stress, improving body composition, brain health, all the things that people want with fasting. For women, we need to eat within a half an hour of waking up because we have a cortisol peak and we need to drop that peak. We also see from circadian research that fueling throughout the day improves sleep, but it also improves the feedback for increasing lean mass development and dropping body fat. 
So when we have a big hole of no food and what happens for the most part is women will start a fast and they'll try to hold their fast till noon and then they end up working out fasted. And the brain, especially the hypothalamus, is like, what's happening here? There's no fuel for this exercise. I'm going to start breaking down lean mass because I need some amino acids for some fuel and I can't support really metabolically active tissue when there's no fuel coming in. So when we start looking at what's the best way to counter the body comp changes that are happening in perimenopause, train smart, eat, eat during the day, stop eating after dinner so you don't have nighttime snacks and making sure that two to three hours before you go to bed was your last meal so that you can get into a deep reparative sleep. And I know sleep is fleeting for lots of people in perimenopause. So we need to work on the sleep hygiene and maybe it's adding supplements like epigenin and L-theanine. Maybe it's cycling progesterone to help with sleep so that you do get into that deep parasympathetic activation so that your body knows that it can change body comp because you cannot create change without enough calories and without good sleep. Yeah, I, this, but again, another huge trend, as I'm sure you know, is this whole idea of fasting, fasting, fasting. And I, I you know, I, I don't understand how hormonal issues and or just if someone who is someone who is active, how do you not eat and then also be active? If you're someone who doesn't right. move all day, right? Yeah. Okay. And I, I, I know that um, I think she was on my podcast. I think you did her podcast and it all, you know, she goes on about like autophagy and how it's, it's actually really important for women to be fasting in their 40s. And this whole idea, like this is, it's actually much healthier to do it. I, and we went back and forth because, you know, I see, I can see how it is for men. I, I see how men respond to the fasting mm -hmm. differently. Mm -hmm than how I've seen yeah. women respond. Absolutely. And from a physiological perspective, women have two areas in the hypothalamus that is very sensitive to nutrient density. It's The two areas are, are the arc areas, and we have what we call kispeptin neurons that get expressed. When we don't have enough food coming in, we don't have all those kispeptin neurons being expressed. So we have a hit on our entire endocrine system. So that's not just estrogen and progesterone. It's also things like thyroid and our appetite hormones. Men have one area. So their sensitivity to nutrition density is not nearly as sensitive as it is for women. And I'd like to scope it down to calories per kilogram fat-free mass. When we look, women need a bare minimum of 35 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass to be able to maintain some endocrine health. Ideally, you want to see people up to 40. For men, it's 15. When you start to drop below that 35 for women, we start to see a lot of dis subclinical disturbance in endocrine and sleep and body comp. For men, when it's 15 and below, we start to see that disturbance. So there's a massive threshold difference. So when we start talking about fasting, yes, men are going to respond because their hypothalamus is not as sensitive to low calorie. But from a biological standpoint, women are more sensitive to no calories because we're the ones that are or were responsible for reproduction, for carrying a baby, having a proper menstrual cycle, being able to support the ongoing aspect of survival of the species. So from a biological standpoint, there are specific sex differences in the brain that people don't acknowledge when we talk about fasting and fasting protocols. And so you would recommend a maybe a 12 hour window at best. Um, and the, the uh, a I have a protein. I mean, do you do you do you believe that? What's your idea? Because I know I think I also see that you're not someone who eats animal protein, right? You're you you eat plant. You eat. You're not. A yep, I'm primarily plant based. When I travel, because I travel so much, I'll use um, organic Greek yogurt and or whey protein because it's readily available. So uh -huh. that would be the only kind of animal product I put in. Um, for protein, we see that there is an age and sex difference in the way your body responds to exercise and protein. We see that when women start to hit 40 onwards, we are more what's called anabolically resistant to exercise and protein. So that means that we need more protein and we need a 
a stronger dose of resistance training to get our bodies to build and maintain lean mass. For men, that starts about 50, 55. So when we talk about protein and protein intake, (laughs) women really need to dial it up because that recommendation that is based on the bare minimum to prevent malnutrition is still circulating as the needs for people. If you're a sedentary person who's in bed all day, every day, then yeah, the recommended of 0.8 grams per pound, that might work. But for women and men who are active and trying to rebuild and promote that body comp, we're looking at that 1 to 1.1 grams per pound as a bare minimum. And that is to stay healthy, maintain our endocrine system, and keep building bone and mass. So I'm so surprised to hear that you uh, are not an animal protein person because, A, you're so fit. I mean, it's insanely, (laughs) you're you're insanely fit. But I mean, just in terms of the satiation piece of it, right? Like animal protein, for me, is much more satiating. And plant uh, protein, I found it harder to get enough of. Mm -hmm. Are you mm-hmm. saying it's just e- equally is okay in terms of building lean muscle mass? Have you were yep. you an animal yep. protein person and you switched or what was? When I was fifteen, we took a uh, field trip to a pig slaughterhouse down the five. <laughs> so um, that will I've do been, it. Uh, yeah. So I'm well beyond 15 now, and that was the first like four way into it. I had issues back in the day because there was no such thing as plant based, and so I've kind of fought my way through. But I've been plant based for a very very long time, and it's you go through the whole. You have to have complete proteins at every meal. You have to have X this X that, but it's not about that. It's about the total amount of protein you have through the day and making sure that you have all of your essential amino acids. And the important part, yes, is leucine content post exercise. And if we look at pea protein isolate, it's just on the cusp of having enough leucine. So you have a little bit of a bigger dose of the pea protein than you would the whey. But when we're talking about meal and protein in a meal, if you're taking adnami, green peas, nuts, seeds, other beans, maybe some tempeh, then you're going to get your 40 or 50 grams in one meal. And it's going to be a mix of all your essential amino acids and you're golden. It's just really understanding nutrition. And I think that's one of the, mm-hmm. the lacking points is the education around it. That's right. Well, because even when you said that, I'm like, well, aren't you also getting an, a, a lot more carbohydrates, a lot more fats when you're saying you're eating edamame and all these other things? Like, It's mm-hmm. easier to eat a piece of chicken, let's say, than Absolutely. to, right? And so, yeah. and so, but you said that, what's the, what's the best sources of protein that you find for people who are not uh, animal protein eaters? The big ones that I try to get people to put in are tempeh, um, spirulina, <laughs> pea oh, protein yeah. isolate. Yeah, spirulina is really good in iron and protein. Um, and so for the supplement is pea protein isolate. Uh, we look at some of the fortified almond or or um, coconut yogurts. They can be highly fortified in protein as well. So there's lots of different options. But when we're looking at carbohydrate and fat, women are afraid to eat carbohydrate. And for the most part, they don't eat enough. And if we're looking at the plant-based proteins, we're also getting a lot of fiber, which is really super important for our gut microbiome. So when we're looking at all the animal sources, yeah, they're high, high in protein, which is a great hit. But we also have to look at how are we keeping that gut diversity and also getting enough carbohydrate. So it's not one or the other. Ideally, it would be a mix. But for me, I've been plant-based so long. And through the years, I've tried to put in egg or fish, and I just can't do it. It's just really brings me right back to my time when I was 15. Um, At a pig slaughterhouse. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. It's crazy. I, I know it happens to me too. What about supplements? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, like gross. Well, what would, what would you say are supplements that are fundamental for women's health? Or do you say, or, or are you somebody who don't believe in supplements? Because supplements oh, people no. think is food. It's not. It's a supplement to what you're actually eating. To the eating. things that you're eating. Right. Yeah. So there, I would say the big three would be, uh, Creatine monohydrate for sure, because 
you can't eat 22 chicken breasts in a day to get enough creatine to support (laughs) brain and gut and heart health. Um, There's so much evidence about creatine being so beneficial for men and especially for women, even in pregnancy. Um, So that is probably my number one. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids, really, Mm -hmm. really important, especially for perimenopausal women who are active to help with the antioxidant capacity as well as the um, actual cell membrane and cellular capacity. And vitamin D3, because we live in a, a global community of you know, sunscreen, hats, clothing, avoiding the sun. And we live in the, you know, I live in the very, very southern part of the world and we don't get a lot of sun in the winter time. And vitamin D is so important for every system of the body, including things like iron and iron absorption. So if we look at vitamin D, that's that's the third one. So those would be the top three. And then, of course, you can add things like um, your adaptogens if you want, your protein powders are good. We talk about the extremes of performance enhancement type supplements. There's no real evidence for women. Things like beet juice, where you know beet juice became a thing a few years ago. For postmenopausal women, sweet. It works well. It helps with vasodilation. It helps improve VO2 max. But for uh, premenopausal women, including perimenopause, it has a a backwards effect because we have estrogen that's tightly tied to our vessels. And that's part of the nitric oxide cycle that causes vasodilation and constriction. So if you're introducing nitrates, it interrupts that system and you end up with a disconnect in what we call orthostatic hypotension or poor blood pressure control. Uh, Kate Wickham out of... um, Where did she do it? She's in Copenhagen now. She did research on this, looking at the differences between premenopausal and postmenopausal women in nitrates and saw that, yes, it's beneficial for post, but not for pre. And then things like beta alanine, it may or may not have an effect for women. So it's kind of in the, there's not enough to elucidate the evidence for it to be pro-women. So that's why I'm always like, okay, let's stick with the big three. And then we can do an individual basis. 